What's up guys, it's Apostle Jonathan Baker and I am so excited to welcome you to the Lagoa Light Church YouTube channel. What you are about to hear is a word from God that I am sure is going to bless you, encourage you, and uplift you in your walk with the Lord. Here at Lagoa Life Church, we specialize in relationship over religion, accountability over judgment, and the faith language. What that means in layman's terms is we help people establish their relationship with God and with their peers, while also helping them become accountable in their walk with the Lord. We also help people speak those things that be not as though they were, because faith, in essence, is the way to God's heart. Let's get ready to get into the Word. But before we do that, if you are impacted in any way by this video, be sure to like it and share it with someone else so they too can be blessed by the word of the Lord. Also, if you'd like to continue to receive content like this from us, be sure to subscribe to our channel. And last but not least, if you are in the Atlanta area, we would love for you to come and worship with us. Every Sunday at 11 a.m., you can find us at 2365 Pleasantdale Road, Atlanta, Georgia, 30340. LagoaLifeChurch.com is in the description box for anyone who's not in the Atlanta area and would like to join the E family. I hope to hear great things from you concerning this word, and I know that it's going to bless you. Shalom in the Lord, yes, you are today. <laughs> no matter what I experience from my people, he's still with me. Somebody say he's with me. <laughs> Look at this. He said, I swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. Do you know that some of you are going to receive the promise that was sworn to your grandmama and your granddaddy because God is going to fulfill it through you? Oh, yes. I'm talking good today. God speaking. Some of you, the promise that God told you, your grandkids going to get it. Because it's your lineage. It means something. Abraham left a good name before the Lord ah, to his descendants. And that's why Judah. I'm trying to help the saints today. See, that name means something. Because if your name is good before God, God will bless your seed and your seed seed and your seed 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 and the fourth seed after that and so on and so forth. Because you left the heart posture that was good before him, pleasing before him. And you know what he said? He said, you know what? I got to honor my word. That's why the righteous is never forsaken and that seed ain't never begging for bread. And Deacon Thomas, I'm in 2021 and bread now means money, not just loaves of bread. So in other words, I ain't going to never have to worry about my children begging for bread, food, and never begging for money neither. Because we the lender, not the borrower. If you're a witch, church, say amen. amen. Numbers chapter 13, verse 31 in the ESV. Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. <laughs> it says, then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. They say this after Caleb gave the report. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. <laughs> and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. Uh, this is my part, my part right here. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Now, people of God, this is good points for you to write down. Here we go. Sister Kelly, you ready? Let's run it. The Nephilim are giants. Who are they? Well, the word Nephal in Hebrew means to fall. And Nephilim in the Greek means semi-divine beings. Let me clear that up. It's a little blurry. Wait till, wait till they get these notes down. So Nephilim are giants. And Nephilim comes from the Hebrew word Nephal, which means to fall. And in the Greek, Nephilim means semi, which means half, divine beings. So half of them are divine and the rest of them is mortal. Pay attention. Pay attention. I'm going to talk to you right here. And so in Genesis 6 verse 4 in the ESV, it says... The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. In other words, fallen angels were having sex with women on the earth and they were creating giants. I'm going to help y'all today. I'm going to help y'all today. I'm going to help y'all today. And so in Numbers 13 verse 33b in the ESV 
it says, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Um, put it on screen, Sister Kelly, so I can go ahead and go into this. The truth of the circumstances caused them to have a pessimistic perspective. Pay attention right here. Now, here's the problem. Their concerns were valid. What that sound like? All you have is all you need, don't it? You see how these sermons tie back in? I wrote the spirit of Caleb in August. I wrote all you have is all you need in, I want to say, December? Wow. Holy Spirit ties in this sermon from previous to the sermon after the one that came after. Oh, Jesus, y'all ain't catching it. Okay, and so remember what I said in all you have is all you need? Even if your concern is valid, Deacon Keith, the minute that you allow your doubt to overcome your faith is not valid to God because obedience is still better than sacrifice. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. Now I'm going to make that make sense for you. Imagine an area that's filled with people as big as Goliath. I see everybody in it. No, let's make it make sense. See, they don't put that in the comic books for the Bible. But realistically, the reason why the Israelites didn't want to go in there is because everybody in there looked like Goliath. I say everybody in there. They was Nephilim, then their sons was the sons of Anak, which was also big like the Nephilim. So they like, my God, today, this is a suicide mission. <laughs> but if you pay attention to what I told you a week before and the week before that, there's a kill order on your destiny. Canaan is your destiny. There's still a kill order on it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if the saints not missing. This Hartsfield Jackson in here right now. They like, yeah. look here. Uh-uh, uh-uh. The, the reason why it's like this, <laughs> the reason why there's giants in there, is because you have to have an anointing to kill giants. So unless you ever take out one, you won't know what that's like. God don't anoint people for things they ain't never been through. He'll anoint you for it, but he won't give you a full measure until you go through it. You have to overcome. See, in basketball, we don't call them a scoring champion unless they have scored a lot of points that's worth being a champion or recognized for it. We don't give a record to a person unless they've done something that goes against the mold of what we're used to. Oh, I'm going to talk to you right here. Uh, 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 you have to be willing to go through the fire in order to come out and say, I'm unscorchable. It can't take me out because my God is a consuming fire. So his flames is way bigger than those flames. Can't light a candle to it. I'm going to talk to you right here. And so the Nephilim, they're the real thing. But watch this. In Numbers 14, verse 22 in the New King, God addresses this doubt. He says, because all these men who have seen my glory, where? In the wilderness. And the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness. And have put me to the test now these ten times. And have not heeded my voice. They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers. Nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Can I talk to you right here? See the problem was this. God uh, got them out of Egypt. And while he was en route doing that. He allowed the water to turn to blood. And frogs to pop up in the land. And locusts to pop up in the land. And Everything to go dark in the daytime. I mean, y'all understand what I'm saying? I mean, he allowed flies to show. I'm talking about he allowed so much thing, the bulls, everything to pop up. He allowed so much to happen to these people, the Egyptians. And, and, and he did this to show his people his strength. Then they get out of Egypt and the Egyptians chase them. And the Lord drowns an entire army of a nation in one sweep. Gone. The whole army. I said the whole army. The whole army. Done. That's a nuclear bomb before we ever heard of nuclear. And he did it with, with natural things. The waves came and devoured them. But the thing that's getting me is that he let the land become dry land for them where it was a sea just for his people. I think that's what we need to pay attention to. Forget the waves coming on the, okay, yeah, they hit Egyptian, but the fact that when they got to the shore and there's water there, it's like going to the beach and the entire, everything on it splits in two and you walk straight through. So he said, I showed them in Egypt, showed them on the Exodus, then while they were in the wilderness, I gave them manna. They were hungry. They were complaining about me. I gave them meat. 
Somebody gonna get it tomorrow. Yeah. They were complaining about bread. I gave them bread. They were complaining that they were thirsty. I made water come out of a rock. Uh, in their hearts, they were grumbling about, well, while Moses seeing God, God let everybody touch, come to the mountain. Purify yourself, come to the mountain. And he showed up. Moses went there for 40 days and 40 nights, came out shining. He ain't dead. Never heard of. You see God, you dead. He let him come back. Oh, people of God, y'all ain't listening to me. So now when they're saying, it's too much. God is saying, they put me to the test these 10 times. Can I explain something to you right here? This is a, a side note to the point I got. Sometimes God is, we're seeing judgment upon people and it ain't the devil and it's God. And we're going, I don't know what they did, but God know what they did. This ain't their first time. Y'all don't like that gospel. I'm going to talk to you. This ain't their first time. They've been doing this over and over and over. So he got to the point where, you know what? You done tested me these 10 times. You ain't going in. It's too much. Somebody do us wrong three times and we did we done. Shoot, some of us too. We'll be like, hey, look here, beloved. Listen, I love you, but hey, stay back there. And some of us, some of us, we don't even say I love you. We just be like, <laughs> hey, look, cuz, hey, it is what it is. Right? That ain't the heart posture of Christ. I'm talking about the flesh. Don't look at me like that. Y'all know y'all got a little flesh. We got to crucify it every day. Amen. I know I do because I'll be ready to say the N-word so fast. They be like, Apostle, don't say that. I'll be, be like, these are oh, Jesus. I'm, I'm a transparent pastor. Okay. So moving forward. Um, so he said they tested me 10 times. And you know what? Since they have not heeded, I'm going to tell them. Certainly the land I swore to their fathers, they ain't going to see it. You know what happens? This is why I did it. Put it on screen, sister again. God took their doubt personal because it personified their lack of confidence in him as their deliverer. Yeah. Yeah, See, the doubt is offensive to God because it lets him know that you don't believe that he can deliver you out of the hand of the evil one. I'm going to look at the camera. See, doubt is taken personal by God because without faith, it is impossible to please him. Hebrews 11, 6. So doubt is God's, you know, he, he, it really bothers him bad. Because he goes, after all I've done for you, and you're going to treat me like this? Like I ain't come through time and time again? Matter of fact, the reason why you over here doubting me, I could have not even let you wake up and breathe to even doubt me today. But you doubting me with the breath I gave you this morning? and you They don't like that gospel, Deacon. I'm going to preach it anyway. Because it's the gospel, not my gospel. See, the gospel is that grace and mercy is undeserved yet given freely. What a friend we have in Jesus. You're right. Because he's the only friend I know that will sit there and get stabbed back to back to back to back by your doubt and your complaints and your rebellion and your disobedience and your lies and your dishonor and your disloyalty over and over again and still take you back when you say, Lord, forgive me. It's hot in here now. Oh, yes. Uh, and so, 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 God's taking the doubt personal. He's like, listen, man, I ain't going to kill you, but you know what? I can't let you get the promise that's meant for you because you ain't got it, and I got to give it to somebody that's going to get it. Yeah. <sighs> so then this is what I see. Caleb's optimism only equated to his faith in the promise that God issued in Deuteronomy 1.8. God says, see, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and the descendants after them. So this lets me know something. When God gives us a promise, it's going to come to pass if we believe it and then if we act on it. See, there's two catches right there. Number one, you got to believe the promise, and then you got to act on it, because faith without works is still dead. It was dead back then. <laughs> it's dead right now. It'll be dead tomorrow. Faith without works is dead. Can I help you? Can I show you what that looks like? If you want to lose weight, but you never go to the gym, it's just a dream. I'm talking to you. If you, if you want to start a business, but you never go get the LLC, it's not happening. It's just a dream. That's a good idea, baby, but you got to put some work with it. Can I help you? Uh, if you want to make it to the NFL 
and you're 22, you're going to have to work real hard because it might be past your time. But you might can make it to the Canadian League and you might can reach some scouts if you create content where people that's worth somebody going to see you and you might get a tryout. But you got to work really hard to make that might become a possibility, to make that might become a yes. And what am I saying to you? Even impossible situations become possible. I've seen walk-ons make it to the NFL. I've seen people that never was working out in college get a scout, look at their footage, tape it, get somebody like Calvin and say, let's shoot this footage, create this content, be consistent, tag these people, call their lines, email the company, then finally somebody hits back and says, you know what, we're going to give you a 10-day contract. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And you got 10 days to make your worth be felt. Amen. And some people have stayed in the NFL and made millions of dollars after 10 years, a couple thousand dollars. They say, we're going to give you a chance, you got to prove it to me. What am I saying to you? Sometimes the promise starts with a 10-day contract. Sometimes the promise starts with a little bitty thing that you don't want to do it because you feel like it's beneath you. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, uh, God, you know, like, like Lord, Lord, I just love you, <laughs> Lord. I lift your name on high. God, you gave me a passion to sing, and I want to worship before you. God, the prophet prophesied that I would be leading the praise team at a church in my future. God, they don't see me. God, like, I'm watching how you worship in the pew. Right, come on. Come on. Small thing. It's the... the peace and be here with me. That's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Listen, you, you, God, uh, I need to go get my passport because I know that you've called me to Tokyo. You've called me to India. You've called me to Greece. Come on. You're sending me to the nations. I know it. It's been prophesied. What was last week's sermon called? Don't forget what? Don't forget what? Well. Let me make that make sense for you. Fine print might be, okay, God say, don't get the passport right now. Hold on. Hold, hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let's master. <laughs> oh, I'm going to talk to you. Let's master being able to hear my voice so good that if I say right now, right here, the person standing next to you at the checkout counter, that's the soul I want to reach today. Because it's very difficult for me to believe that you're going to be able to hear God in first class on Delta on your way to Tokyo if you can't hear God next to, to, to the cashier in QT. It's very difficult for me to believe that. Because whatever you do now is what you do later, just more magnified. The 10 day contract shows me whether you're worth a spot on the team. And even after that, people that get off the 10 day contract, they don't start. They ride the pitch and come in when necessary. I'm in my vein, Deacon Thomas. I feel the Holy Ghost. So what I'm discovering is that God wants to see if you can work with the gifting he gave you before he puts you in the office. Come on, come on. Come on. Talking about ah, Jesus. Hey, 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 look at me like this. Can you follow Jesus when he ain't got nowhere to lay his hand before we send you to the Acts Church and 3,000 come to your ministry of one sermon? If you need the correlation, I'm talking about Peter and them when they was walking with Jesus. And the Bible says foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And those 12 disciples, even the crooked one, followed him for three years. Can you do it? 365 times three before you ever get called out to go and plant the church? If we change locations in this building 15 times before God give us our own building, will you come with us? I hear the Holy Ghost now. He's talking good today. See, 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 the mark of a disciple is that they follow their teacher wherever they go because they understand that I need what's in their loins in order to get what I need for the next part of my destiny. And I'm going to tell you something. The reason why I'm so glad, ah, I'm so glad that I came back to my bishop when I did is because, oh, Jesus, is because the time that he spent before he transitioned to glory, I got everything that I needed to get and glean from the man of God before 
before he transitioned. Because in order to make disciples, you must first be a disciple. Yeah. I'm trying to talk to y'all today. I'm trying to talk to y'all today. Put it on screen. God's promises don't evaporate based on tragedy. Our faith determines if we will see them come to pass. Yeah, COVID happened. We still gonna plant churches. Jesus, the visitor caught it. Uh, yeah, COVID happened. We still gonna launch the ministry. The next one. Yeah, COVID happened. We still gonna lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I found something. Uh, Brother Winberry, what I've discovered about God is that sometimes we've been like, dang, the world falling apart. Actually, it's falling in place. Because God said, I got to tear this thing up so I can show them they need me. And if I show them they need me, they're going to act right when I call them to do it again. <laughs> it's like, oh, we have a good turn. Boom, shut down, sit down. Let's fix everything that you thought you knew. The saints go, what's going on? I'm going to tell you what's going on. God getting rid of the convocations. God getting rid of the organizations. God getting rid of the ceremonies. I'm going to talk to you. God getting rid of the performance. God getting rid of the soul. He's trying to take the posture of the heart. Uh, it's canceled until next year. Might have to cancel it again. I don't know. You know what? That's okay. Because as long as we cancel in the performance, but keeping God in the mix, we good. Yeah. And what am I saying? I'm not saying the ceremony is performance. I'm saying that there's an ounce of pride in what we do. God ain't glorified flesh wars. Hey, you know why I love John the Baptist, Deacon Keith? Because see, Jesus said, of all men born to I mean, men born to woman, excuse me. There's not a greater one than John the Baptist. The best part about that is, is that John the Baptist himself said, I decrease so that he may increase. In other words, if I bring myself down flesh and say, God, whatever you have for me, I'll do that. What happens is that he increases in you. Can I help you right here? Let's exegete the text. When he said, I decrease so that you may increase, he was saying physically and spiritually because that was the way God intended it for him. See, John the Baptist had to come off the scene so Jesus could come on the scene. So the minute that John the Baptist got incarcerated, Jesus came on the scene into his ministry. Y'all ain't paying attention. But what I'm seeing in the spirit realm is not everybody is meant to come off the scene for another to come in. God just wants your flesh to come off the scene and your spirit man arise up. I ain't got time to play with the saints, my God. See, 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 all 12 spies were commissioned to go do the same job. They saw the same land, but only two of them saw it with different lenses. See, Joshua and Caleb, they went with the other 10. They saw the same geographical destination. They saw the same coordinates, but when they came back, they had a different report. See, many a couple. See, many are called, Deacon Kim, but few are chosen. <laughs> the chosen choose how they perceive things. The chosen choose their intimacy level with God. The chosen choose how much time they spend in the Word. The chosen make a lot of choices, and that's why God chooses them. <sighs> See, our perspective has a lot to do with our faith levels. Ah, Jesus. Our perspective has a lot to do with our faith levels. Put this on screen. See, you can have faith and still not be fully confident in the promise that God issued to you. And that's why we ask God to increase our faith. Yes. See, see, I remember that story. The man said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Yeah, yeah. He and then, and he had no faith. He needed more faith. See, he might have had enough faith when he asked God to come heal the baby. But he didn't have enough faith for God to raise the baby. So he had to ask God to give him resurrection faith. Oh my God, I'm talking to them. See, he, he believed that Jesus could raise his daughter out that sick bed. But when the baby died and he got that report, now he knew it's beyond me. I ain't got enough faith for this. I've never been prepped. I don't have enough faith for this. I've never even heard of Jesus raising people from the dead. Remember, Lazarus hadn't come yet. Oh, Jesus. But then... He said, you know what I do know? I know that if the man could raise my sick baby up, he might be able to increase my faith so that I can believe he'll raise my baby back from the dead. Some of you got enough faith for God to change the infirmity in your life, but you ain't got enough faith for God to revive the dead relationship.
him. So what you need to be doing is asking God to increase your faith. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, we need to increase our faith. Look up to the heavens and say, God, increase our faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you to say it as a conglomerate because we're two or more gathered in his name. There he is in the midst of them. And when the people of God come together in unity, it's like the oil that ran down from Aaron's, ah, from the top of his head to his beard, even to the skirts of his garment. And some of you gonna get a touch from God right here in this very moment if you have enough faith that God will do it. I see some of y'all catching it right now. And God said he'll do it. You know why? Because when faith plus faith plus faith plus faith plus faith plus faith times the rose in the church combined together, God starts granting miraculous, insane, ridiculous requests quest because there's so much faith in the room he ain't got no choice but to listen that's why you need congregation this Baptist church might be okay for the sick bed but you need the congregation for the deaf bed sometimes it go beyond me I just I just my God today oh Jesus so this brings me to point three God identified Caleb's spirit as different from the others because he believed the Lord's report. God identified his spirit as different, Sister Caleb, because he believed the Lord's report. See, 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 see. Isaiah 53 1 says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? God gives us a word or a promise to help shape our faith and then increase it. See, the word is coming to increase your faith. How do I know that? Because <laughs> in Romans 10, 17, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So God is giving you the word and the promise to help shape your faith and then he's going to increase it. That's why we don't need to despise prophecy because prophecy is like a jump start to faith. Did you keep? I've been in situations where I've been in the church and people were, I mean, they were depressed, distraught. You can see it all over them. Then God had somebody speak prophetically into their life. And what happened was that person, everything on them, it's like it broke off. And they were like, oh my gosh, God still cares. And it jump started their faith. That's why the devil is trying to discredit the prophetic office because he knows that a lot of times that if we discredit the prophetic, we'll discredit the jump start to our faith. In other words, the jump of cables that you need are attached to the prophetic gifting. But if you don't receive and you despise prophecy you are getting rid of the jumper cables needed to jump start your engine yeah. it's a lot of gems in here Holy Ghost is talking this ain't in my notes nowhere Romans 10 17 New King says so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God Numbers 14 30 says this you will not enter and occupy the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. Can I help you right here? Caleb was mentioned first. Amen. Deacon, I'm going to play on that, that cartoon theory we learned as kids. Joshua is important, so important. He is because of Jericho. But let's talk about Caleb because of Canaan. What I'm discovering here is that Caleb, put it on screen, had the right destiny helper. Y'all know I love that word, those two words. Caleb had the right destiny helper. I'm going to break this down for you. When God sends you somewhere to possess something, he sends you with the sign destiny helpers. Who remains with you is based on who believes and adheres to the word of the Lord. I need y'all to really pay attention here because God is speaking. I hope y'all don't miss this. If you do, the YouTube will be up by tomorrow. When God sends you somewhere to possess something, he sends you with the sign destiny helpers. However, who remains with you is based on who believes and adheres to the word of the Lord. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you that God sent all of them out there with 11 destiny helpers, but only one of them was found faithful. I see 12 spies went out. Y'all missing something. 12 spies went out. Only two gave a good report. So we went out with 12. <laughs> and I came back with two. Because realistically, I'm only counting the ones who got the faith to believe in what God said. That's why Gideon had to trim his ranks. Because he had 32,000. But 22,000 men 
men were afraid. They didn't believe that they could take Midian. See, it's not about the numbers you have. It's about the numbers who actually believe the Lord's report. Whew. I'm trying to talk to y'all right here. Pay attention, pay attention. Look at your neighbor and say, Caleb, find your Joshua. See, 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 it's not about how many friends you started with and how many friends are still here in your walk. I'm not worried about that. What I'm concerned about is who speaks life into you. What I'm worried about is who's speaking the word of the Lord to you. What I'm worried about is who can intercede with you. Can I talk to you really quickly? If you can't pray with me, I don't want you too close to me. Because if you're too close to me and you can't pray with me, when the devil show up, you running. In other words, you might run your mouth, but you ain't going to run your prayer. I ain't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me what you think the devil doing. Tell me what he is doing. Watch and pray. See, Jesus had 12 disciples, but only three was in that inner space when he was about to go to Golgotha. I'm going to talk to you now. And where is Golgotha? The place of the dead, the place of the skull. What's that mean? That means that God is trying to give some of you an anointing to conquer your Golgotha, your skull, your dead place, that place that you don't want to go to, the place that you're dreading, the place that's going to get you ah, out of your predicament. But the problem with it is you need to learn who's really supposed to go with you into that inner space before you get there. I gotta talk to you. Everybody can't go to go golf with you. Ha! But some people gotta prep you before you get there. Oh, I'm gonna talk to you right here. And a lot of people are running from the three that's in Gethsemane because they think all 12 is supposed to go with them. And they're not understanding that there's a difference between the 70 and the 12 and the three. You see? You see, you see, you see, the Bible says that all his disciples deserted him. But once he got to go got he looked down and he recognized somebody. And there was somebody standing right there with his mama. There was somebody standing right there with Mary Magdalene. And his name was John. And then when I look in the book of Revelation, the one who got the revelation about the seven, ah, the seven seals and the scroll being opened and the heavens and the earth, the end and the beginning, the first and the last, who was it? The one that was at Golgotha. See, some people will follow you all the way up till Golgotha. Then they'll desert you there. But the ones that go all the way with you, they deserve to get the intimacy, the secrets. See, if Jesus can expound his secrets to the one that went to the dead place that you need to be able to give your secrets to the one that's standing by you through the thick and the thin. Many times we don't trust people but if they're proving to you they're going got the worthy you need to be willing to open up your heart because that's not somebody you be transparent with that's somebody you be vulnerable with yeah. 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 theologians don't know where John was at they don't know how he died I bet you don't cause he ah he was on the island all by himself with God. Yes. And I remember a scripture. Oh, Brother Dixon, I remember a scripture that you sent to us this week. And that scripture says, some of you standing here will not see death until you see the kingdom. Yeah. Come, on, Come, on. Come on. Which lets me know more people could have got the revelation. But how many was willing to go to Golgotha? Yeah. Wow. Look at your neighbor and say, exegete the text. Closing passage right here. Numbers chapter 14, verse 24 in the New Living. God said, but my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. He has remained loyal to me. So I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of that land. Point four, Caleb's attitude was different. Caleb's attitude was different. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, your attitude matters. I know your heart posture is good, but you got to tell your face because your attitude and how you treat God's people will make people either cling to you or pull away from you. Let me give you scriptural background. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. My attitude comes from my way of thinking. Whew. Romans 12 2 let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you what's bold right there think <laughs> Brother Santana, I get excited right here that's the Holy Ghost right here see the way you think ultimately tells the story about who you truly are so I can tell a lot about a person by the way they think it's not always about what they say, it's how they think. Because out of the abundance of the heart that's connected to the mind, the mouth speaks. Yeah. See, God said, these people honor me with their lips. 
but their heart is far from me. What are you saying? He said, their heart ain't with me, so their mind ain't with me. Deacon, where, where did he go? Uh, their mind ain't with me, and then the next thing I know, they talking different. See, 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 we need to start checking people with the way they talk before they talk the big thing. If you pay attention, you can find it. If you pay attention, you can see it. Oh, Brother Dixon, I'm going to talk to you. See, there's not a person that's done, done something to me that I didn't notice how they was talking before they did it. But let me explain what we do. We listen to what people say and we dismiss it based on what we think they're going to do, not based off what they really do. That's why the children of the world are wiser than the children of light. Because the children of the world go, oh, if it quack like a duck and look like a duck, homie, it's a duck. And then the Christians go, no, nah, it might be an eagle. It just got some duck-like characteristics. <laughs> no, baby, right now it's a duck. It need to be transformed by the renewing of his mind. Then it'll be an eagle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Come on. Oops. I'm trying to help y'all today. Somebody say, the way I think tells a lot about who I am. Last day. Numbers 14, verse 24 in the message gives us a clear, more clearer expression. But my servant Caleb, this is a different story. He has a different spirit. He follows me passionately. I'll bring him into the land that he scouted, and his children will inherit him. Mistress, if you'll come up now. Uh, the thing I want to highlight here is he has a different spirit. In the NLT, it says, God told him, he's loyal to me. He's loyal to me. See, loyalty matters. At Lagoa, we say loyalty over everything. God over all, that's what it stands for, Lagoa. But the thing about that is that loyalty matters so much to us because loyalty matters to God. God said, he's loyal to me. Yeah. Your spirit it, it, it can really be identified based on how you move, the way you think, your loyalty. He has a different spirit because he has a loyal spirit. He has a different spirit because he's passionate about what I'm passionate about. He has a different spirit uh, because he follows me passionately. He has a different spirit because he believes what I tell him. See, <sighs> your spirit, man, so important. And we can usually identify based on how you move in the physical. Because everything in the physical is a byproduct of what's going on in the spirit. Are y'all paying attention right here? And so this is what I love right here. His children will inherit it. Caleb's descendants received an inheritance from God based on his actions. Y'all want to know who is in Caleb's lineage? King David. The prophet Isaiah, the prophet Micah, the prophet Amos, the priest Zerubbabel, Zephaniah, and of course we know the man himself, big dog, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus was in his lineage, but the descendants received an inheritance because of Cain. I'm telling you, your name means something in the spirit. Actually, your name in the spirit means much more than it does in the natural. Because who you are to God is what's most important. And can I say something? You can turn up yourself up a little bit. Can I say something? Uh, the truth is, uh, <laughs> demons got to know who your name too. Evangelist Remy, see, there's this passage in the book of Acts that I love. It says, the, the son, seven sons of Sceva, they were casting out devils. And the Bible doesn't say they was flaking or flogging. They really was casting out devils. And then they got to this one house. And they got to this one man. And they went up in there with that same mentality they had, but with the previous deliverances. And they thought because they, they had clout in the previous deliverances, that they was going to pull up in this house and have clout with the devil too. But when they got in there, the strong man mentioned them. He said, wait a minute. Paul I know Jesus I know but who are you I don't know your name not one of you when I tell you it's imperative for even the demons to know your name because if the devil don't know your name good luck I, I, 
I want heaven to know your name. But see, if heaven knows your name, the devil gonna know your name too. Y'all ain't paying attention right here. Cause see, oh Jesus. Cause see, 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 see. The devil has to go by the spiritual laws that are in effect by the third heaven. The second heaven falls underneath that heaven. So in the second heaven, demons, if they don't know your name, it's because the third heaven don't know you. See, he said, he going to say in that day, many going to say, Lord, in your name, I prophesy. That's nice. In your name, I cast out devils, multiple. In your name, I did signs and wonders. Jesus said, he going to look at him and say, depart from me. He doesn't even mention anything about what they did. Because they were willing to be used by God, but they didn't really want to know God. He don't even address it. He just goes, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. It's not about how you start, it's how you finish. Because I'm pretty sure at some point they was in the right place and then they slipped. But God ain't worried about how you start, it's how you finish. Oh, Yo, y'all better listen to me. You know how I know that? Because biblically I can back it up. When Jesus was on Calvary, there was a thief right there that was dying because of his sins. And on Calvary, he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me. Remember me when you enter into paradise. <laughs> remember me. Remembrance goes back to knowing someone. <laughs> He didn't start off good, but he finished great. Because Jesus' response to him was, I tell you the truth. I just got a revelation, prophet and speaker. He, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. You were once in bondage, but see, the truth will set you free. So I'm telling you the truth. You will be with me in paradise. I'm changing your perspective because you thought you weren't good enough. And in the last moments of your life, I'm telling you that I'm transitioning and you coming with me because I'm looking at your heart posture. Again, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. Paul didn't start off good, but he finished great. Oh, Jesus. It's not about how you start, people of God. It's how 